Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I'm not sure if this is the last panel in the UAE Pavilion tonight, but we're getting close. It's been a long day, a very successful and eventful day here at COP. I'm Danny Seabright, president of the US UAE Business Council, and we're honored to be able to uh, be with this illustrious group of, uh, of speakers to talk a little bit about the energy transition and how the financial community can assist with that energy transition. It's an honor to convene a panel here in the National Pavilion of the COP28 Presidency, the United Arab Emirates, and I could not be more pleased to bring together, uh, as I said, these friends uh, from two major U.S. banks and from the uh, Ministry of Energy here in the UAE. Uh, already this COP has made its mark in the realm of green finance, notably UAE President His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed announced the creation of the Altera Fund, a $30 billion catalytic climate finance vehicle aimed at mobilizing the capital and investment needed to fight the global climate crisis. We're clear-eyed, though, however, about the challenge ahead of us and the scale of the funding that really, truly needs to be mobilized. The IAE's net zero roadmap says, says limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is still possible, but investment in clean energy needs to reach $4.5 trillion by the year of 2030. Within this context, I'd like to introduce our speakers. His Excellency Sharif Alalama, Under Secretary for Petroleum and Energy Affairs at the UAE Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure. Jay Collins, Vice Chairman and Corporate, uh, Corporate and Investment Bank at Citi, and Jay Hureen, Managing Director and Global Co-Head of Energy Investment Banking at JP Morgan. We really appreciate all of you being here today. I'm gonna let each one of them sort of make a short opening statement to sort of set the, set the stage, and then we'll launch into a short uh, discussion. Your Excellency, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. And it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to actually join uh, this uh, wonderful uh, panel and my colleagues over here. Um, Danny, you uh, highlighted a very important point. We are at a crossroad right now in terms of uh, identifying that there is quite a lot of action that is required. And for or in order to achieve this action, there are significant amounts of fund that need to be sourced. Uh, of course, we as the UAE have recently launched and uh, updated our energy strategy, which is committed to tripling our renewable energy capacity uh, by the year 2030. Uh, in addition to improving our energy efficiency of our systems by 42 to 45%, no wonder that this would require a lot of funding. And we are anticipating somewhere in the range between 150 to 200 billion dirhams that would be required over this period. Uh, it is a challenge. We do have plans in place, and uh, we are confident based on our track record and our history and the vision of our leadership that we will be delivering accordingly. Outstanding. Jay, I'm going to turn to you. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Jay Collins. I'm a vice chairman of banking at Citi, and uh, let me just say a couple of things of the importance of COP and why... Uh, I'm here and our team is here. Um, first is we are committed to net zero. Um, and we believe that we can't transition and, and get net to net zero unless our clients transition. And the engagement with our clients is absolutely critical um, to develop those plans, the strategies, the operationalization, implementation of uh, uh, along that pathway, uh, and it is a transition. Um, second, I just agree with you in terms of the difficulty of everything that we're facing, and we see that across the board of what people are talking about uh, about here. Um, I've said many times since I arrived that it's very frustrating if you look at the uh, committees that the net zero uh, committed banks, insurance companies, pension funds are on, um, I, I reread, I think, seven different reports from each committee. Um, we've had the recipe for a while. We repeat the recipe over and over in these reports. 
um, and we still haven't implemented. So we just keep echoing the same themes. 80% of it doesn't change, and uh, it's really time to see that we execute and implement it. So we're excited to be a part of that, and hopefully today we can talk a little bit about what that actually means. Thank so, you. So that's, so that's the real challenge for this COP, and the one that uh, it's looking increasingly like we might make, this might be a change. We might make a turn in the road here at this COP, at least halfway through at this point. Jay, please. Um, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Jay Harine. Um, as Danny said, I co-head our energy power and renewables business globally, and I also head up North American Investment Banking. I'm very encouraged by what I've heard here at COP and what our clients, to Jay's point, are saying to us. I feel like, uh, as Your Excellency said, we are at a crossroads, but very encouraged by large companies, small companies, governments, and others coming together governments coming together to address the opportunity in front of us. Yes, it's a challenge, but um, the, the sense of innovation, the sense of excitement, the sense of community around it um, is very uh, uh, exciting. And we at JP Morgan are very optimistic about the future and what the future will bring. Um, so thanks again for being on the panel. Thank you. Um, Your Excellency Sh uh, Sharaf Olama, um, so you mentioned, you talked about 150 to 200 billion AED that you need by 2030. Um, are you gonna ask these two banks to help you with that? What's the, wh what's your strategy for coming up with that? I mean, I know, we know you have a lot of, you know, wonderful natural wealth, but, but you're not spending all of your natural wealth on these things. You're also doing public-private partner investments and, and partnerships and things like that. So what's your strategy? How are you gonna meet this, this, this goal? Uh, I, think, uh, I think the best way to describe this is, is what we have done to date. Now, um, first off, I have to clarify is that the funding, the 150 to 200 billion, is focused in two major areas. One is, of course, the expansion that we anticipate for the renewable energy capacity getting to three folds, up to 14.2 gigawatts. The other, which is also as important, is improving our energy efficiency by 42 to 45%. Now, when you look at the renewable energy, we have a track record. We go back to 2006 when we found Mustler. Back then, the cost of a kilowatt hour was four times the cost of a kilowatt hour using natural gas. Now, when you look at the prices that we are able to achieve, they are at around $1.35 cents per kilowatt hour, a massive improvement. And how did we do that? Well, basically it is 20% uh, of these projects are funded through equity, and the equity comes either from the government, partly, and the other comes from private sectors. Uh, a good example is uh, the two gigawatt Al Dafra project that was recently uh, uh, inaugurated. A uh, partnership between the government, EDF, and JINCO. 20% uh, equity, 80% debt. Um, when it comes to energy efficiency, on the other hand, we are seeing quite a lot of uh, support from the private sector in terms of not only supporting us with technology that improves our energy efficiency and consumption in buildings and industries, but also arranging for the financing of these solutions. Uh, the reason is, is because they see the uh, economic benefit to doing that. They are so sure in terms of the technologies that they have that the returns are so lucrative that they are willing to fund these kind of energy efficient solutions. Uh, with renewable energies, it's the same thing. It's a bankable project. You're talking about a guaranteed offtake over a period of 25 to 30 years. So any investor would find this very lucrative, and it's not a problem for them to actually commit. Um, there are certain challenges that we see, of course, with, uh, with, with getting these kind of funding. So when talk about the challenges a little bit more. Maybe these two guys can help. Yeah, well, one is, uh, if I talk about now, I want to take off my hat as UAE and talk about on a global basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the risks maybe are minimal when it comes to the UAE and the setup we have over here and the ease of doing business and investments that are uh, uh, introduced into the country. But there are regions that have high risks. 
And the fact remains is investors are worried getting into these regions to ensure that they actually do have the returns that they anticipate. Uh, this is one challenge, and we do know that there is uh, over 700 million people around the world that don't have access to electricity. 1.2 billion people don't have access to clean uh, uh, cooking uh, uh, gas. So this challenge needs to be addressed, and what kind of mechanisms do we need to put in place to reduce the risk for uh, financiers and make this commitment happen? This is, I think, one of the biggest cha challenges. The other, of course, is, is giving uh, the uh, assurance that the funds are actually being spent where they are required. And that requires systems, systems that actually monitor how the emissions are reducing, systems that verify that these emissions are actually reducing and that the funds that are put in place are giving the results that we want. Very, very important. Uh, Jay, from J.P. Morgan's perspective, uh, you know, your, your plans are to facilitate more than $2.5 trillion to address climate change and contribute to sustainable development, including, as my notes say here, $1 trillion for green initiatives over the next 10 years, from 2021 through the end of 2030. Uh, from this perspective, can, can you say a few words about how you're going to do that, how J.P. Morgan's going to accomplish this, and, and then maybe throw in a few words about the de-risking aspect that uh, His Excellency raised as well, please. So let me start with the, the de-risking, because I think it's an incredibly important point and part of why it works so well here. We're doing a better job of stimulating supply, whether it's through government programs or, or um, the private sector, large corporates, what will be helpful to banks to help fund is to identify demand, and that may be through exchanges, it may be through longer-term contracts, it may be through other innovations, but identifying uh, that demand will enable uh, these companies to avail themselves of the lowest possible cost of capital, which will enable them to, to prosper and continue to, to expand their offerings. So we are working cooperatively with all constituents and stakeholders to figure out ways to lower the cost of capital, which basically speaks to your excellent point, which is we need to identify demand that you can, you can finance against. Um, JP Morgan, through our CEO, Jamie Dimon, and all of our employees, some of whom are here today, uh, is committed to those numbers that you mentioned. Uh, through capital markets transactions, through a variety of other mechanisms um, that we employ, tax equity, uh, advice, raising money for clients and the like. We believe that we will do that um, across, in, in, in a partnership with our clients, in partnership with Wall Street and in other financial providers. And um, as others have mentioned, that's only gonna get us part of the way to where we need to be but our hope is that it's a significant part of that. So I was at a conference this afternoon at a session and, and uh, the, 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 one of the speakers said, if we just had Taylor Swift taking this on uh, and motivating the world to get more excited about these things, it would be a lot easier. Do, are, do you find that you, I'm gonna come back to you in a second, Jay Collins. Okay. Do you find that you, that you can do, that, that your clients at JP Morgan are getting more and more motivated and concerned and engaged on these issues? I, I think they're extremely excited about the opportunity. I think that people want to move forward. I think that there's an aspect of, of if you will, cleaning up the environment, but there's all an all, also an aspect of innovation. Uh, electric cars are amazing. Um, and the future for homes, for mobility, for other things we believe will be better in the future along with decarbonizing the planet. So, so the hope is that we can have both. I think that this fantastic COP just shows, based upon the number of people who are here, the level and quantity, seniority of the, the companies, the governments, the financiers, the like. This, this is all you need to know about how excited uh, and um, forward-thinking people are, as opposed to trying to go back. They're trying to figure out ways that we can collectively move forward through technology, innovation, and collaboration. Outstanding. J Jay Collins, C Cities are committed to achieving net zero emissions associated with its financing activities by 2050. Can you walk us through how Cities going to accomplish this? 
what are some of the challenges you think you're going to face and how are you going to overcome them? Um, so let me, let me break that down. I think first um, there is an, there's an internal process of operationalizing those commitments. Um, but there's also the external environment, both the clients and uh, a variety of factors that have to happen. And you don't and control any of those, right? I well, mean, we, well the, the, so the, the, the first what we do is controlling the operational, operationalization process and the rigor of that process. Um, and Jane Fraser, our CEO, has put that in place. Um, and I think what's important about that is uh, and it's important for what's happening here is, is sectoral approaches become critical to any operationalization. And by that I mean you look at the Poseidon principles and shipping, the steel principles. We have to have for all significant emission sectors, we have to have metrics that we agree upon, ways to manage, by, to, to, to measure by sector. Um, and within that, to agree on pathways to, to one and a half to two degrees. Um, and importantly, principles around that and fundamentally, ultimately, commitments around that by sector. So, you know, a bank, any bank, financial institutions can only move that transition to the degree that there is agreement of that sector of how to get there and that we all agree on the principles in and around that. And we think that we have to have more of those. So we've been working to continue to roll out those principles. Um, for, for 2025, um, the next round of NDCs, we don't believe that we will have success in the world in delivering, not just closing the gap and having better ambition, but actually having NDCs be real, and, and real I mean right now if a sovereign tells us that they've made a commitment in their NDC, but they've had no sectoral dialogue. In fact, they've had very little private sector dialogue. How on earth will they deliver that if 60, 70 percent of their economy is in the hands of the private sector? So that dialogue asked, absolutely has to happen, but the client dialogue between bankers, financiers, and, and those clients have to happen. So that's part of what we control. But just at the high level, and if you want to dig deeper, we'll talk about this. Most importantly, we need policy signals. We need regulatory policy signals. That was they, my next question. How is government helping yeah, so you So that's, this? I mean, that's, I mean, fundamental. You, carbon rate mechanisms are critical. Um, and there are a plethora of those. You're going to have from CBAMs in Europe, to all the tax incentives and their mobilization factors for the IRA in the United States. Um, we're gonna have a series of carrots and sticks at, that will induce um, and in some cases accelerate that ambition. In, importantly, from this, what Jay talked about in the technology and innovation sphere, in, in, the, in the US with the IRA, it's accelerating risk taking that where the break evens didn't work, um, and the risk is not emerging markets risk. The risk is technology risk. It's, it's that that technology doesn't make sense to invest today without that, that um, incentive structure and signal from, from the markets. But let, let me just say one last point. We have to enable the environment of the world that can be grids, which are hugely behind. It can be making uh, the emerging markets more investable. Uh, we need the development banks to de-risk, others to de-risk in the capital stack, um, where the G7, uh, I'm sorry, the, the G fans committed pension funds, insurance companies, and banks can't take the kind of risk that we need them to take. Um, and we have to have more projects. And fundamentally, one of the things that we should all be screaming about here is, is that when City looks around the world and says, you know, give us the feasibility study so that we can make bankable projects for your countries that will deliver the NDC, we're finding a dearth of projects. We're just not getting those projects. We get concept papers, don't get me wrong, but we can't model or make bankable or fund 
three pages of thoughts. Um, and so we need to accelerate radically the number of viable projects. How, how, can, how can other governments help some of these governments that are sort of nascent or, or just starting out in the process to, ex to accelerate and push that along? Do you have any, do you have any views how government policy, how? Well, we're seeing that. I mean, we're yeah. seeing that here in spades, the, from you know, the Green Climate Fund to RST. Um, we're seeing philanthropic organizations, NGOs, and with a lot of pressure, even the development banks surging the number of both resources and bankers, um, but funds dedicated to the what's called project development, that right. early stage development where uh, bankers need that work to be done, countries need that work to be done. Some of it's as simple as technical advice, um, but that, that we, we don't have enough yet, but you hear walking around COP, everybody's focused on this issue. I was with some of the development banks last night at a small dinner with Mrs. Clinton, and they were talking about exactly that, how this COP is, is a, there's a new effort to bring the development banks together and work in a way that they've never done collectively before. So very exciting. Jay, um, Carbon Compass, uh, say a few words about how that's impacting the way your, your, your bank works, and then we're going to talk about hydrogen. <laughs> so it's a, a JP Morgan structure where we basically are trying, much along the lines of what Jay was talking about, to bring a scientific-based third-party analysis of how we can better uh, reduce emissions on a go-forward basis. An example is with regards to methane, we have a white paper out that we've published about how we're working with our clients to um, identify leaks to reduce methane um, uh, going into the atmosphere. I think that it can be measured. It can be, um, uh, there's no loser in that. There's only winners in that as we reduce. And so we're trying to work with our clients. We're trying to work with our, um, uh, uh, the entire stakeholder universe to work with these companies to, do, to bring best case technologies, best case ideas to them. I think one of the things that, that I've seen at this COP that I think has been extremely uh, encouraging has been so many companies coming together that didn't have relationships before, their industries didn't interact before, but now they do. And, they re, and you're getting ready to hydrogen. Hydrogen becomes something that almost every industry has a stake in and a point of view. So we are um, uh, very encouraged to see the idea that um, as people collaborate, as, new, as people meet each other who haven't before, as they come together um, uh, at something like COP um, and the size and the magnitude of this one, that there'll be so many good ideas that come out of it that will help propel us forward. And that's part of what we're trying to do with our clients is limit existing emissions, but even more importantly, work towards a future that will we'll have emissions-free uh, energy for everyone. Wonderful sentiment, thank you. Your Excellency, we talked first about the UAE's hydrogen um, uh, plan, as, 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 as you reminded me, and as I remember very well during COVID, uh, when we were all on, uh, on virtual, and the UAE at that moment, you know, we're all worried about COVID and how to deal with COVID, and the UAE is announcing a new national strategy on hydrogen. And a few of us are sitting back in Washington going, what is going on with these guys? Uh, you know, they're just all over the map at this moment. But here we are a couple years later, and you're, you know, talk to us a little bit about the hydrogen production stages of and commercial viability and how you're going to overcome some of these obstacles when it comes to financing uh, with hydrogen projects, especially at this early stage. Um, Danny, uh, like you said, we've been working on hydrogen now for quite some time and uh, we have been engaging on an international level with a lot of our strategic partners to understand what has gone right and what are the areas that we really need to focus on. Uh, as we speak, we have over uh, seven uh, hydrogen projects currently underway in the UAE. Uh, we anticipate to be uh, producing around 1.4 million tons of hydrogen by the year 2031, 1 million ton being green and 0.4 million tons being blue hydrogen. Um, 
Did you know, I just read today that one of the world's biggest reserves of hydrogen under the ground is in France. I didn't know that. Uh, true. Did you? Yeah, that, yeah I just yeah, read this yeah, today. Yeah. It's supposed and, to be and, huge. And, and, and there are more that are, 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 are going to come. Yeah. yeah. Um, when it comes to funding, of course, this is a challenge. Now, I'll, I'll mention some statistics. Uh, I found this very, very interesting, is out of all the projects and the production levels of hydrogen that have been anticipated from now to the year 2030, there's around somewhere in the range of 57 million tons of hydrogen that are planned to be produced. Amazingly, only 10% of that has off-takers today. And only 1% of that 10% have a binding contract. So it just shows you that you know, there is some concern with the consumers in terms of the viability, the economics behind getting this hydrogen and buying it. Um, how are you going to fund these projects? Well, we've seen a lot of good examples, and uh, Jay mentioned some of them. Like, for example, when you see the, the states, the Inflation Reduction Act. This is a wonderful tool that over the next three years, I believe, eventually will lead to getting hydrogen at competitive prices. When you go to Europe, you have the CBAM, you have the uh, uh, carbon, what do you call it, carbon contracts for difference. You have the ETS, emissions trading uh, system. Um, when you look into other countries like uh, Germany, they have uh, uh, created uh, what, they, what you call H2 Global. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting uh, model where you have a bidding process of having hydrogen producers actually auction the hydrogen they have at the prices they have, and then you have the uh, consumers actually auction the prices that they want to pay, and you mix and match. And eventually, with time, you see that the differences become closer. Uh, you fast forward and you come to the Gulf region, you see Oman, what Oman has done, and they have been very aggressive. They have had concessions related to hydrogen. They've been given excessive uh, competitive prices when it comes to land lease, uh, subsidized electricity for green hydrogen. So there is different mechanisms that are being followed across the entire globe to make hydrogen a feasible solution. Uh, I think it's going to be a mixture of all. but. The common factor going through all of them is exactly what Jay mentioned, is there has to be some sort of a pricing mechanism or a credit mechanism for carbon. Without that, you, you, you don't stand a chance of getting a lot of these projects sanctioned. Um, we believe, of course, with our projects, we have a number of banks, like um, I was reading some st statistics out of the top 10 Middle Eastern banks, Four of them are in the UAE. First Abu Dhabi Bank. Uh, Islamic Bank of Dubai mm -hmm. and others. Uh, with a total asset of around $650 billion. And 75% of these banks do have comprehensive ESG strategies. And uh, they are very keen in terms of funding a lot of these projects that we are anticipating. Hydrogen has a very high potential future. It's just a matter of time with the development of technology and scalability I think it will happen. Your crystal ball, when is that tipping point? Well, from what I'm seeing in terms of technological development that is expon exponential today, I expect within the next 10 years, you're going to have very competitive prices of hydrogen. Jay, you, you had a comment, I think. Well, I was just going to, um, Your Excellency, add a little bit to what you, what, you, what you said, which is, you know, interestingly in the hydrogen space, um, de-risking is, is critical. And de-risking, we often talk about it in, in a credit sense of the emerging markets, but when we have technologies that are evolving, and we don't exactly know not only which do technologies will dominate, um, but actually at what price, uh, and you have these very long-term contracts, um, Fundamentally, across the board, in addition to de-risking by development banks and capital structures, we have to have strong credit off-takers. Ultimately, at the end of that supply chain, at the end of that flow, that's how a bank gets good with funding. Now, if I'm a strong credit off-taker, let's just say in Europe, and I would take Middle East, North African hydrogen, 
for the Japanese. There is a bet on that price and the duration of the risk of the technology changes that can happen. And unless that's taken, then getting to that next breakout stage of hydrogen could be very difficult. Even with what we saw with the Ukraine war and the crisis in, in Europe, we did not have, and we looked, we were the COP27 climate finance advisor, and we looked to see it was logical that Europe should have taken the bid on that, and they didn't. And part of that is just this, um, the, some of the uncertainties that exist in the supply chain um, and in the technology. If you allow me, Danny, uh, uh, Jay, I think you've also touched on a very sensitive topic. It is the supply chain. And this is where we've seen, and as part of our strategy, is we are developing what you call uh, hydrogen oasis. It's your typical hydrogen valleys, as is known in Europe and North America. And the whole concept of having a oasis is to cut down on the cost. So minimize the transportation of hydrogen, have the production uh, source close to the export, and have a port right. nearby. Right. Um, technology, as you mentioned, is crucial. Because you know, the other day I remember in one of the conferences, there was um, a gentleman from a company called H2 Fuel. And he presented to me a small bottle of uh, crystal, white, white crystal uh, pieces. And you know, for the first, when I saw it, I thought it was either, uh, <laughs> it was either something that is banned or it's just medication. And it turns out to be a, a solid hydrogen. And all it requires is some water to release the hydrogen. Uh, of course, it's at a TRL4 right now. It's not developed to a commercial state. But this is the type of technology we need to make the transport of hydrogen cheap. Nice. Jay Horan, you, you currently serve as the global industry co-head for energy, power, renewables, metals, and mining at J.P. Morgan. Talk, say a few words about how you bring all of that together in your portfolio and what you're responsible for, and then maybe add a little bit on the renewables piece too. I find the mining piece particularly interesting. Is J.P. Morgan going to be financing missions to the asteroids to get some of these critical minerals in the future, or? We'll see about that. Um, <laughs> my, my, old boss, be my old boss, Secretary William Cohen, wrote a, bo wrote a book <clears throat> about this recently, so. That would be pretty neat. Um, <laughs> I think the point of having all of that under one roof is that increasingly they're interdependent. And so when you think about critical minerals, uh, rare earth minerals, they may not be, hopefully not as rare as we think, and we are going to try to help finance the thoughtful um, um, uh, extraction of those um, uh, around the world. We've put that entire suite of assets together because increasingly the energy world, the power world, the renewables world is all coming together. In fact, it's coming together with transportation and other aspects as well. Um, I think that Items like artificial intelligence and other things, again, give us hope that there will be ways to speed up innovation, ways to speed up technology, ways to come up with better ways to better methods um, to explore. We, we see this with, as His Excellency said, the, the cost curve being bent on so many of these things as they come to scale. There's reason to believe that they'll be bent on others. So again, the reason we brought that all, all under one roof is to um, enable those companies to interact with each other. Uh, and then uh, in my new post running North America, we're trying to bring a variety of companies together. You have packaging companies that are trying to clean up their packaging and green it up. They're, and in the number of people interested in hydrogen includes car companies, automotive companies, um, uh, oil and gas companies, power companies, renewable. I mean, everybody has a stake. So I think it just goes to show, and again, uh, to say for the third time maybe, this COP, the size of it, the scope of it, the people who are here just goes to show that this is a, a force that's coming and, and through things like artificial intelligence, the, the, the role of government as Jay talked about and the like, I really think that, that the future, reasons to be extremely optimistic on a, on a longer term basis as we go forward. I'm going to I'm going to give each of you a minute here to, at, to in, in closing. I like to do this sort of crystal ball five years from now. We're sit, the four of us are sitting on the stage. It's five years. It's COP, COP 33. 
and what's one or two or the three issues that you think in a short in a short time, amount of time that we're going to be we're going to be dealing with at that moment. But before I let the, ask them to do that, I'm going to ask you, sir. You have a chance to implore industry, implore business to help you in what you're trying to achieve. What are the three things you need? What are the three things you need, not just from the banking industry, but from, uh, you know, I represent the US UAE Business Council, so I'm very, you know, jealous about the US UAE trade and business relationship. What do you need from our companies to be successful in this energy transition that you're working on right now? I think uh, one is uh, for sure uh, technology. Um, we see the future of uh, uh, the energy landscape. It's going to be definitely an energy mix. Uh, for people who talk about uh, phasing out fossil fuel, uh, I say that this is not, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, you are going to end up with a situation where you will need every and all sorts of energy. It being fossil fuel, uh, hydrogen, renewable nuclear. energy, nuclear, and all. Yeah. The, the challenge over here is when we talk about technology is the problem is not with the fossil fuel. The problem is with the emissions that are resulted from using fossil fuel. So we need technology to actually make capturing the emissions from fossil fuels economic. And currently, of course, what we see is, for example, if you look at the power plant, to capture CO2 from a power plant, it costs you somewhere in the range of 200 to $300 per kilogram of CO2 which is very expensive and it does not make sense economically. This is one. Uh, the second uh, where we do require support is, uh, of course, uh, funding. We are doing our funding, but also there is a part that needs to be played when it comes to oil and gas funding. And the reason why I say that is, uh, I've said this in more than one panel, we've been hearing about peak oil now for decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. we're still waiting for the day that was going to come, and it doesn't look like it's coming anytime soon. So the problem can only be exaggerated is if we do not invest in oil and gas today. Invest in oil and gas and invest in reducing emissions and capturing CO2. I think these are the two main issues that come to mind. If a third thing comes to mind, I will... I will highlight it. No, as that's well. that's perfect. That's perfect, and it, it underscores uh, a, as well a lot of things that your national leadership have said lately. So, um, so Jay and Jay, you have your crystal ball, and we have two minutes, a point or two from each of you on at COP thirty three. What are we going to be talking about? Well, let me just say that it's difficult to look five years out with a city <laughs> hat on. Maybe I'll be personal here, but I think a lot of the decisions we make today will play out then. And if we're not careful, we will have in COP33 a number of tipping points. Um, first and foremost is, is that if we, if we don't synchronize the supply demand of energy in the phasing out of fossil fuels and the phasing in of alternatives, if we get that timing wrong, we have extraordinarily negative consequences. Second, we're going to be dealing with the consequences of net zero commitments of the, the financiers, including the net zero asset owners and asset managers. And if you're not careful, at a, at a certain point, they will phase, they, they will operationalize fixed income, just like they did equity, including in the sovereign space. And they will have to negative screen and tilt three to five years from now, which means that you can strand entire sovereigns that stayed brown as they either decide to abandon net zero or to stick with it. And then the third thing that I think we should really look out about is by then we will not only have mandatory reporting for corporates, but we will have that across the board, including scope three. And in that world, FDI will be fundamentally rerouted. So if you're rolling up Coal, coal in Southeast Asia, and you're saying, am I going to invest here or there, and I'm serious about scope three reporting and investors are holding me accountable, we will just see people move away from, from brown to green roll-ups at a scope three level, and our trading system, our supply chains, our FDIs, and the future of a number of uh, sovereigns will be at stake if we don't get that right. So huge consequences for the next three years of how we get that right that could be crisis level tipping points in 33. Well, thank you. But 
Jay, I want to live. Maybe Jay has an optimistic point on that. On that uh, very serious so I, one. So I think, um, and what I'm hopeful that we'll find, and I and I'm actually confident that we'll find is the number of people in this effort will be materially larger. It'll be on a global basis. Taylor Swift will be there. <clears throat> the Maybe even row. Taylor Swift. <laughs> but I, th I think the role of innovation, technology, collaboration of people who have never collaborated or had reason to collaborate, I think there's a reason to believe that we can bend cost curves, we can, be we can bend technological curves. And part of it is educating the world population about the opportunity in front of them as, as his Excellency said, the number of people who want energy, I have a wonderful client who keeps saying this, the number of people who want affordable, reliable, clean energy is everyone on the planet and not everyone has it. And so we, we all have a responsibility to help that happen at the margin. I just think the as you can see with the growth of COP, I expect it'll be larger. The COP 33 will be like that. So I'm extremely optimistic about what's going to happen um, on a go-forward basis. Thank you, Jay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're at time. Please, a warm round of applause for our, uh, our speakers. And uh, great thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you sir. As always. Uh, when are you coming to the US? Uh, soon. Uh, soon. Soon as and when? Like, uh, after, after the news.